what up? Welcome to another episode of the Dealer Talk Podcast. This is your host, Herb Anderson. Thank you so much for tuning in. Super excited. I got Mr. Benny Major on the show today. We're going to have an awesome, awesome session. I'm working a little bit late, so I'm at the dealership right now, but wanted to make this happen. So, Benny, what's up, dude? How are you, man? I'm doing good, man. Just chilling, sitting in the <laughs> beautiful city of St. Louis, you know, enjoying these 45 degree temperatures in December and fat and happy, man. Life's about choices. <laughs> I to be happy. There you go, man. So, <laughs> oh man, I can already tell it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so, um, kick us off with the, with your background, dude. Tell us what you what you've been up to, man. Um, I never sold a car in my whole life. A lot of people ask me, they're like, what? I was like, yeah, I never sold a car in my whole life. So I started off in the uh, underground vehicle service contract aftermarket warranty industry a long time ago and was really, you know, pretty good at it in regards to sales. And I realized that, you know, it was direct mail they were using for marketing and, you know, the response rate was only 1%. You had to close at 10%, you know, or else you got fired. So it was, it was pretty yeah. boring, old school, but that's the type of shit that, you know, I liked and I learned when I was younger and, you know, it just translated, went to the yellow pages after that was pretty good at, you know, selling two page ads and stuff in the yellow pages. And, you know, obviously every car dealer was in the yellow pages, then transferred over to a uh, yellow pages.com. And then I was lucky enough to travel around to third party Google offices and teach people about Google AdWords and Google places and Google plus and teach them how to sell it. And by doing that, it obviously increased my knowledge base. And then I left there and wanted to further my career. So I went to a broadcast television NBC affiliate here in St. Louis, was there for a year and a half. And then I decided, you know, I think I can do this on my own and deliver better results to the dealers. So here I am. Right on, dude. Oh, so I didn't know that. Uh, so you're, 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 you got your, what, your own agency or, or are you just like, what do you, what do you currently do right now for the dealers? Yeah, so I'm all on my own. I own my own company. So about 18 months ago, I decided to go off and branch off on my own and start my own business. So yeah, I'm 100% work for myself. And that's what I do. So are you building strategies, just all kinds of stuff, traditional, um, digital combination? Are you doing content like, you know? Great question. So one of the things that I do is, is I don't do any traditional marketing whatsoever. Everything is completely digital. So no radio, no TV, no direct mail, no print, no magazines, nothing along those lines. So obviously the heavy focus is on video marketing, content creation, you know, Google, social media, all those other types of things. My philosophy is, you know, it's all about the dealer and I care about how many units you move every month. I care about, you know, your show rate, your closing percentage. I care about all that type of stuff, but I also care about, you know, your consistent message to your audience, making sure it's consistent across the board, but also, you know, having a little bit of humor in there to separate right. yourself from everybody else that stands behind a podium and screams at you about the $200 lease you should come in. and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the message is definitely important for sure, man. That's, that's, that's key. I think it's Jason Harris that always is always talking about telling the story, right? Finding a way to tell your story. And I totally agree with that. And I like what you said, that perspective of humor. I think that, it's so important to be able to, to, to um, connect, right? You have to be able to connect with the audience. Um, and I think that for, and I've said this so many times, dude, but there's the, it's, it's kind of easy to differentiate yourself in the fact that if you tweak things a little bit, if you do things just a little bit different, maybe it's just that, maybe it's just creating content that's funny, right? Um, uh, and that could be something that, that resonates with a certain, um, audience and that's going to give you a leg up. That's going to give you an, an advantage. Um, Absolutely. And a lot of people just, they, they try to do the same thing. It's kind of how I look at co-op. You know, if you want a cookie cutter program, you want to do what every other dealer, you know, in your market is doing, then do the exact same co-op program. If you want to yeah. stand out, if you want to have a competitive edge, if you want to have a differentiator, you know, then let, let's find out who you are, what you represent and let people know, you know, what your brand is about. You know, personally, let's try to connect a little bit with that human element that I see so many people leave out, unfortunately. Yeah, dude, I like that. I like what you just said there because, um, you know, and kind of to develop that a little bit, but what, what are your thoughts on, um, 
how do I say this? Um, I feel like it, 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 we in, in this industry, we kind of were followers, right? There's not really innovators in the sense that there's not a lot of dealers out there willing to take a risk. I mean, some of the people that come to mind, obviously, Brian Benstock, for example, uh, is willing to do things a little bit different. And he's had some huge, huge payouts. I'm sure that he's ha he's tried some stuff that hasn't worked as well and where, that he's failed at it. Um, um, but look at what he's been able to do because he wants to be different because he wants to try things um, and, and try to do things differently and not so much follow. I think that it, within the industry or, you know, I don't know, give me your perspective, but do you think that it, within the industry, we, we, we tend to just, uh, you know, something's working down at the dealership down the street and then we just try to copy that or emulate that. And that's why we end up in this in this environment where everything just looks and feels the same from one store to the next to the point where it's like, you know, uh, you know, you see a commercial and all the commercials tend to look the same. You see a Facebook ad and all the Facebook ads tend to look the same. The third party side stuff, it all tends to look the same. Do you think that that's that's that you know we're just we're afraid to to innovate within the industry or or you know what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean honestly, I think it's fear and lack of knowledge. You know, I mean you, you in a lot of the situations or instances that I see is you know it's worked in the past for so long, so why would we change it? And you know my philosophy is always why not? If you can't answer why not, then we're probably going to try it. You know, I'm a huge fan of Brian Benstock, you know, 100% huge yeah, fan, yeah. huge advocate of YouTube. I believe he said, you know, for his success, it took him about 44,000 store visits, you know, to sell whatever many cars. But then he really broke it down and he said 40% of our traffic is from YouTube, but that only accounts for 8% of our marketing budget. So I don't know what kind of fear you need or what kind of fear you yeah, have. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Forty percent of your traffic is coming from eight percent of your budget. I mean, I'm no David Copperfield, but abracadabra, you know. <laughs> 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 it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it, that's 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 another good thing, right? Because I think that a lot of the times we, you know. Um, and I hear this often, often enough, where it kind of irritates me. But um, you know, I hear this comment that we're not, um, we're behind digitally in the automotive industry. And I think Sean Welsh was the one to actually introduce me to this idea. And when he said, it, I was like, "Whoa!" But um, we're not really behind when it comes to implementing stuff. When it comes to not implementing, but when it comes to trying things out, right? Um, I think we're actually very, we're willing to try. But um, I think that we don't measure it. I think that that's where it falls through. Like we, we're, we're very quick to, you know, sh new shiny object, object syndrome. But then it, when it comes to um, following that up and measuring it and, and, and testing that and, and kind of seeing what it's delivering for us, I think that that's where we fail. And so we don't get to see those, those, those you know, we don't get to put those things, we don't get to have those correlations. And so we're very easy to turn things off without even knowing if, if it's working or not. I mean, do you see that happening with the stores that you work with? Um, do you feel that they're resistant sometimes to some of the, the, su the suggestions maybe that you have um, when it comes to digital, even if they're moving in the right direction, but uh, because they're not measuring or they're not paying attention to those, to those metrics, they, they may feel like, oh, this is not working. I absolutely do 100%. You know, I got a whole lot of respect for, you know, Sean, a huge lot of respect, you know, for Jason Harris, all those guys that are really making an impact and helping change the industry. And I, I agree 100% wholeheartedly, you know, with almost everything that both of those guys say. And I guess the differentiator with me is because of my personality and the way I put right. myself out there, you already know what's yeah. going to happen when you do business with me. Like, we're, we're not going to do any, if your competitor's doing this, we're going exactly the opposite way and doing the exact opposite thing. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, fear and lack of knowledge at the same time. It comes down to the bottom line, the ROI. It comes down to how many right. units did we move? You know, how much did we increase our gross? How much, you know, were we able to increase our CPO sales? Or if we're a use lot, a buy here, pay here lot, whatever it is, how much were we able to move the needle? And 99% of the dealers that I talk to, they care about one thing and one thing only, and it's money. And that's fine. That, that's great. So let's go ahead and track everything down to the dollar. And then you can tell me whether or not you don't want to move forward with it. 
But I, I'm pretty damn confident that 99% of the time, if you deliver a positive ROI, it's not going to be a conversation of I'm scared to do this. It's how much more money do you need? It worked. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, so um, make sure that you're not reinventing a brand. You don't see a lot of brand new franchise dealers popping up every day like you do CVS and Walgreens and digital marketing agencies across the United States. I mean, yeah. most of these guys have been in the business for a long time. So you, you have to respect the legacy. You have to respect you know the brand that they've built over time. However, the only thing that's different is the devices. You've always had your audience. You've always owned that audience. You've always focused on reaching frequency, engaging content. You've always done that. So we're really not changing anything. All we're doing is entering into waters that maybe these individuals just aren't as familiar with or seen success with. Yeah. So let, and let's 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 build on that because I wanted to kind of take the conversation in that direction. Um, I'm a big, huge advocate of social media. I think that um, we don't give social media the 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 credit that it deserves and we're not really using it to its full potential yet within our industry i mean there's some dealers that are man and they're seeing some some huge returns my my fear is that that's not going to last forever and i think it's gary vaynerchuk that talks about this a lot but he's like you know now is the time to do it because as soon as everybody catches on man those prices are going to be so high that you know or the or the or the platforms are just going to become obsolete and which you know that it is what it is but right now is a time uh, for better or worse this is a time where you can get really low cost on social media and get huge returns um, yet i don't see a lot of push um on uh, in in our industry on that area and 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 what i've seen a lot of is people doing it um and then oh it doesn't work okay and then immediately getting out sort of a deal um, are you doing social media stuff like Facebook retargeting, for example, or creating lookalike audiences and building campaigns based on that with your with your stores? Tell me about that. Talk to me about that, and um, you know some wins or some strategies maybe that that you know we can uh, leave behind here for the for the listeners. So yeah, social media is a huge part of the omni-channel approach. You know that I use at my dealerships, and I encourage you know anybody that you know has a dealership to use. One of the big things that we look at is the storytelling, as you know, we talked about with Jason a few moments ago, using social media to tell your story. Social media literally has a zero cost per entry, if you think about it. Yeah, you can boost posts, you can run them in ads manager, you can do all these types of things, but you can run, you know, Facebook Live, YouTube Live. A lot of people don't do YouTube Live. I know, dude, yeah. You're yeah. going yeah. to end up on the first page of Google in 48 hours. Like, why are yeah. you not doing that? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I want to hook up your inventory catalog, you know, to your Facebook business manager. I want to retarget the people, you know, body style specific or VIN specific based off of their activity from your, you know, VDP page or whatever the SERP page on your website, things like that. Because I truly do believe, you know, in frequency and increasing that. Video to me is a huge, huge part of the social media strategies that I implement at my dealerships and I talk about a ton on social media. And I guess the big wins, and this is, it's kind of counterproductive, but we, we rolled out a video marketing campaign for a CDJR dealership here in St. Louis about three months ago. And the owner of the dealership said, man, that video is amazing that you did about my story. And I just got two new employees because of that video. And I said, well, man, that shit sounds cool. But the whole purpose of this is for you to sell cars. <laughs> and he, right. said, he said, the video is so good. I had people call me and say, I want to work for a guy like that. Well, my response was, did they say they wanted to buy a car from you? <laughs> so that's my challenge is, is OK, I, I don't I do want to create those compelling videos, but I'm not in the recruitment business. I'm in the acquisition and sales business. So there's a fine line. I love that, that man. That's so cool. You know what I mean? I mean hell yeah. yeah, I'm a nice guy. And you know, I donate to charity and walk old ladies across the street and all that. But I also have 87, 2022 out of 2500 HDs on the lot. You can get for a great rate. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, like, come on, man. At yeah. the end of the day, we're here to sell cars. Well, so, okay, so 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 um, 
why how, okay how do i say this don't you think that there is um an advantage to that though and here's why so i always tell my dealers like you can't it's not advantageous for you to ask an audience to buy something from you until you've given them something of value right so my initial strategy is always like let's create content that has nothing to do with buying a car and has everything to do about your story and your dealership and your value proposition so it's typically um you know like i really like these under the hood like how how to videos you could call them i i say under the hood just because it's it's our industry but a how-to video right and create a lot of that stuff like how to how to change your oil change at home how to check your cooling how to um uh, change your spare tire, things like that, that customers can go online, consume that content for uh, information, and then never tells the customer anything about buying a vehicle. Um, I like on social media, I don't, I, I've seen some of the YouTube and I don't like when those introduction videos on YouTube, but I think on social media, especially if you claim to be a family oriented business, I think that starts with your team. And so you would wanna be proud enough to expose that, right? And, and have people introduce themselves and tell why they choose to work at your company. <clears throat> Excuse me, I went down the wrong pipe. Um, and then the other thing is talk about things that happen behind the scenes. So what happens after I buy the car? Take the, <coughs> excuse me. There you go. <coughs> I don't want you to be alone. Thanks, man. Uh, <laughs> take the customer, take the customer, and um, um, down that journey of, hey, let me walk you around the dealership. Let me introduce you to your service department. Let me, if you give uh, like a, a bag, a gift bag, or something like that, show that you know, dis display all those things. And then, once you've done that enough, then you can start putting ads out there about my inventory. Because at that point, I feel like you've earned the right to, to, to kind of sell stuff. I don't know. I mean, do you agree with that? Like, what are your thoughts? I do agree with that. And the one of the things that we do is we create a want or a need. We never talk about price. So, yes, I want to tell the story. I want you to see, you know, the service drive. I want you to see the back of the service department where all the technicians are and the big old huge giant fans that people don't get to see. And, right. you know, I want you to meet the staff and I want you to, you know, see the personality of people, the human element, all those types of things. And, you know, that's one of the things with video marketing that you can do. And you made a great point. You know, 70 percent of the searches on YouTube are for how to videos. You know, hopefully that allows you from creating those videos to be the trusted resource to break down those barriers and to attack that stigma of the car business being like an attorney and a slimy plastic salesman, you know, <laughs> that people don't trust because we have to address that. But at right. the end of the day, a lot of people like cool stuff. And if you make it look cool, that they're probably going to do it. Like a lot of people follow Gary Vanderchuk. I'm a big fan. I think he's a knowledgeable guy. I don't think he's that cool. But there's people literally out there, like these women are throwing their bras at him like they're the best. <laughs> and I'm like, cool that, but I'm like, man, like you're taking to the next level, bro. Like it is over with. But just putting new things out there, like my buddy uh, Jeff Hunter, General Motors Jeff, you know, on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. So he did a video for a 2020 Silverado 2500 HD. And on his video, I commented and I said, hey man, did you know that all your tow capacities are now on the driver's side inside door jam? So you don't have to Google those anymore. And he was like, man, I forgot to put that out there. Well, for a lot of guys that drive HD 2500 trucks, that's real convenient. That's a great feature or a great thing for you to point out for maybe to trigger their mind and say, you know, I didn't even know the 2020s came out yet. Well, yeah. Let me go take a look at a little bit further into that. So it, you're kind of giving people a, just enough to want more. And then, as you said, you know, bring them down the funnel and do those things. But price is always going to sell cars. Let's be honest. It doesn't matter what anybody says. People afford what they want to afford. Unfortunately, you know, if your competitor down the street has the exact same year make a model for $10,000 cheaper, you're probably going to lose that sale. And, you know, that that's just natural human behavior. You know, people go on Amazon and they want it because they want it in two days. Well, they're also not going to pay another $5,000 just to have it in two days. 
you know, I'm, I'm not a guy that pushes price or anything like that, but realistically, you know, we have to understand that we have to price ourselves competitively. We have to make sure that we're a trusted brand, that we have the products that individuals are looking for, and that we're delivering our messaging, our marketing, and our advertising in a way where it's not high pressure, buy now, you know, boiler room, wolf of yeah. room, that type of stuff. So, you know, I connect with the human element of people. And if I like you, I'll buy from you. And that's all there is to it. But what do you what do you say about convenience, though? Because I think that I think that there's some there's there's an element there that that we kind of miss a little bit. For example, and I go back to 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 Brian, right? So his whole deal of being open twenty four hours, New York being what it is, right? And and how you know he probably doesn't want people going there just because it's it would be chaotic right so for him having you know being able to pick people off and drop them off or pick up their i don't know what i think it, he he picks up he picks people's cars does a service drops them off and he's open 24 7 sort of a deal mm -hmm. right that's extremely convenient when it comes to servicing your vehicle extremely convenient i agree i would pay i would pay a lot of money on top of whatever they're going to charge me in that in that particular city to avoid the traffic to avoid the chaos to avoid the headache just to get my vehicle serviced um and i wouldn't even you know jiffy loop none of that would even be a consideration right um so i agree with you to a certain extent on the on the, on the price factor you know if you have a car that's that has a huge discount like a ten thousand, you know plus or whatever discount it's going to be hard to beat that that deal unless i have something that's more valuable to consumer that which is their time and finding a way to give that back in some way shape or form i mean what, what do you think about that i agree with you 150 percent. and i think in brian's market of new york there's 10 million people you know and it's just constant go 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 so right you know having the shuttle service the ballet service all those types right. of things is is absolutely genius you know right. and, I, and i think in his market that is something that you, you kind of have to have to be a differentiator and have a competitive. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, I mean, General Motors is doing employee pricing till the end of the year. You know, CDJR is doing employee pricing plus till the end of the year. So there's a lot of pricing things that are out there that are enticing to individuals. And, you know, I've said this a million times, you know, every dealer that I know or that I've ever talked to, if I said, hey, this person's going to purchase the vehicle and they want it delivered 10 miles away, you know, next Thursday at three o'clock, will you do it? Well, hell yeah, they'll do it. And they won't even think about it, but they're not advertising it. They're not putting it out there like that in my market, maybe because it's a little more spread out, more suburban, not as, you know, metropolitan as New York. But I agree with that hundred percent. I think a ton of dealers out there offer shuttle service, offer valet service, you know, offer those types of things. Right. And, I just don't think the consumer has been trained by us or the automotive industry yet to expect it. And what I mean by that is we've con we've trained the consumer to come by from the dealership the last two weeks of the month. In traditional media, you know, dealers would advertise on TV the last two weeks of the month, you know, Thursday through Sunday or whatever it was. And we've trained consumers to think you're going to get a better deal at the end of the month. Right. Yeah. If we can train consumers that hey, you expect convenience, you know, you, you, you're entitled to valet or, you know, we offer a shuttle service, you know, we're here to make your lives easier and not make you take time out of your day to service or protect your second largest investment besides your home. I think that is a huge, huge, amazing, impactful go-to-market strategy. And I recommend it highly across the board if it's very good for your market. Yeah. Do you, uh, do, you, uh, do you have dealer clients right now that are doing things different that are maybe um, challenging the status quo a little bit? Like what yeah. are you seeing? You know, I mean, probably the biggest thing with the dealers that I work with right now is going to be the, you know, the human laughing element that just takes the high pressure out of buying a car because that's the stigma across the board is, you know, the, the high pressure they called me a thousand times or this and that you know yeah, yeah. Horrible experience but then you also think about so i think a little bit different you know people are like hey you know what we're going to do is we're going to put a putting green in you know the waiting room we're going to put 87 tvs up 
We're going to have a Plinko machine. We're going to have, you know, all this type of stuff because they think people don't want to spend that much time, you know, in the customer lounge or whatever it is when they're want, get, wanting to get their car serviced. Well, instead of spending all that money and buying all these tricks and games and things to amuse people's mind, why wouldn't you work on your process and cut down your average wait time to 42 minutes so people are in and out and they don't have time to play golf? Those are some of the things that I think that we're doing that really separate us from a lot of people is let, let's look at it you know, as a different approach rather than you know, giving them something to occupy their time. Let's give them more right. time. Yeah, no, I, I like that. Um, I think that. Sorry, man. Um, I, 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 you know, but that's the, that's that's the. How do I say it? That's the. I mean, that's that's a piece of the puzzle, right? The process portion and making sure, like you said, that 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 you're giving the customer that that experience and doing it in a way where the customer feels like their time is is. Um, valued, um, but at the same thought-provoking content. A lot right, of people but, talk about thought-provoking content. But did at the you, same, uh, did you but know, at the same, you know, yeah, right. But at the at the same time, I think that there's that there's a little there's a there's a there's an extra element to that, and it's the you know because okay so here here just follow along this journey here with me for a moment so if you give the customer that sp particular thing right then there's really nothing different than say a jiffy lube in that sense right because you know they're in and out right so um so they get the time factor of it and yeah the waiting area is better and the, the, there's popcorn and it smells nice and stuff but do you think that that would make the customer does it make the, that experience sticky like do you think that customer is going to feel um, you know, good about that experience um, beyond just the fact that it saved time? Or do you think that if you did something like that where you had a putting green and all these things and now it's a destination? And I, I think that's why I was having a hard time saying that. So it's a destination, you know what I mean? So, okay, I'm gonna get my car service, but when I think of my car, I think about going to this destination where it's where I, I get to choose, right, as, as the customer. So I either get to go there to have an experience or I, I can have people drop me off and I can just go about my day. I get to choose kind of what I want to do sort of a deal. I agree with you 100%. I'm not opposed to the destination by any means, you know, and I think there's a comfort level from a lot of people that are in dealerships all the time versus people that go there, you know, every three to five years to trade in their vehicle, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I think people's time, like Warren Buffett said, I can buy anything in the world, but I can't buy time. You know, time is is the deciding factor in a in a ton of situations. Yeah. Offering a valet service, offering you know the putting green, whatever it is. To your point, what you just made is let the customer have the choice. When the customer feels like they're bringing something to the table, such as you know, I have a trade in on a new vehicle, they feel that they have some leverage. You know, in regards to the negotiation, if the customer has the ability to say. You know, I, I think I'm going to go to the dealership because they have free Wi-Fi and I have some emails to answer and a little bit of work to do. So an hour and a half of my time without anybody bothering me might be a good thing. Right. Um, I can, you know, shoot some baskets. I can, you know, play a little bit of golf, whatever it is. It, it, it's not that big of a deal. The big deal is the consumer needs to feel like they're bringing something to the table. And I personally believe that the consumer should always have a choice of what they want to do. Because we have a with everything else we want to do. Yes. I can go to Walmart. I was just there earlier today. Right. I can go to Walmart online or I can go to Walmart online and show up and they bag all my groceries for me. Or you know, I can do a business with Walmart. Right. But I have or I can go to Walmart, get my groceries done while my car's oil change is being done and I don't have exactly. to go to the dealership at all. Right. So that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it makes sense, man. Yeah. So, okay, cool, man. So let's, let's kind of, uh, uh, you know, move things along here. I wanted to talk to you about, you mentioned direct mail. And um, so I wanted to, to talk about that because I'm one of those guys that still sees value in direct mail. I don't know, call me crazy, man. But um, I think, yeah, <laughs> I think I've just had a lot of success with it. I think that we 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 like like what i said earlier right we get into these trends of doing things and then we we're 
because we had success with it in the past, it's very hard for us to do it differently, which I don't get. It drives me nuts. We should always be experimenting, right? That's what marketing is, experiment, do things different, see what else works. Um, but and back in the days, it was like 20,000 pieces and you sent to everybody and you just kind of pray that people show up with that piece and you're like, oh my God, this worked. Now there's a digital element to direct mail in the data portion of it. Right, so I can go into my CRM and I can create these less based on wherever that customer is in the ownership journey of the, uh, you know, it, maybe that maybe it's an oil change for us for service, or maybe they need tires, or maybe their lease is about to expire, or they haven't purchased a vehicle in three years, or whatever, right? And I can create, I can pull that list, and I can send that person a physical piece, right? Um, and I've had a lot of success with that. But I still see these 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 massive campaigns of thousands of people, and then it's like, oh, I only got one percent return. Well, yeah, dude, because you know, like it's. It, I mean, there's a different way. There's a better way to do it. Um, are, are you like? What are your thoughts on direct mail? Are you a believer, or you're like, no, this is completely, you know, like it's just a waste in, in today's age, or you know, like I mean, just be real, man. Tell me what you think I'm a, about it. I'm a huge believer in direct mail. Huge believer in it. If you do it the way that you just said to do it, okay. So number one, if you're pulling all this data out of your DMS, these people have done business with you before. They know your brand. They probably trust you. You know all these types of things. You also have the accurate information about these individuals. Hope right that of their year make model. You know when they should be trading in. When they should be here for you know service appointments. This this and that but your messaging and your creative on that piece of mail is probably compelling enough or engaging enough for them to want to respond or you know inquire further about the offer that you're sending out everybody in america checks their mailbox every day mm -hmm. I mean, and now it's absolutely effective and think about things and data is effective so I, hell yeah i think direct mail is effective 100 percent and you just, just made a great point. Everybody checks their mailbox. And remember, the mailbox isn't in front of the houses anymore. It's on, you have to walk a couple of blocks to get it, and then you have to walk yeah. back home. So if you're really good, then you, you have at least that span of time to capture that 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 consumer's attention, at least. So. Um, and if I see a, a piece of mail from a brand that I recognize, I don't consider that junk mail. I consider junk mail credit offers, you know, progressive right, insurance yeah. that that's I get every point. day, all that. Like to me, that's junk mail. If you know XYZ Motors sent me a piece of paper that said, "Hey Benny, your 2019 Malibu RS just went up ten thousand dollars in value, and you can come get your oil changed here, and it's your choice to putting green, you know, valet or shuttle service. You know, give us a call, and you know, let us know which one of those you feel would be, you know." the most impactful on your day-to-day -day life. Hell yeah, I'm gonna call them. Yeah. You know, it makes sense, it works. So I think any media that's out there is all the same. It's media, math, message, find your audience and own them, focus on consumer behavior patterns. And if you're gonna do an offer base for any type of marketing or advertising, make it compelling. Don't do 10 bucks off a hundred, that's tax. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> If you make the offer, you know, compelling, if people trust you, if people want to do business with you, I don't care if it's radio, TV, direct mail, if you're canvassing a neighborhood, it should be an Elvis impersonator knocking on my door. I don't care. <laughs> as long as I know yeah, it's that might be that might be That's very effective. Right. <laughs> as long as I know that it's genuine and it's, you know, a compelling offer, absolutely direct mail works. So does television, radio, and print. Yeah, that's a good point. I like what you said there about about the audience. I think that 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 makes that makes a lot of sense, right? If you're if it's if it's a business that you have a relationship with, right? Like de and dealers neglect this all the time. Like these customers have a relationship with you post the sale, man. You know, especially if they've been servicing their vehicle there every single year after they bought that car. I mean, that customer, anything that you send that customer, you can send them stuff on the cheap and they're going to consume it because they have a relationship with your store. They have a relationship with your advisor. They have a relationship with your salesperson. So I think that's 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 a great point, man. So check um, this out real quick. So here's, here's kind of how I look at it. I was always the behind the scenes guy. 
So I was never, you know, a Cox Automotive rep or an Edmonds rep or a KBB rep or, you know, car.com rep or anything like that, where I was in the store all the time. They knew my name. I make the phone call. I get the appointment, all that type of stuff, because those individuals had already established their brand, their relationship and their trust with the decision makers at the stores. I didn't have that. So when I started my business and I'm making these phone calls, I'm like, hey, man, it's Benny with Marketing Solutions STL. I was giving you a call. You know, yada, yada. They're like, who are you? Who are you with? I'm not interested. Click. So think about that with direct mail, with everything else. People see that brand. They see that trust. They say, oh, well, man, this is Herb reaching out to me right now. I'm going to give him a call. You know, he's a nice guy. That You've already established that. So I think that's the big key that everybody talks about with branding, 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 branding is, yeah, get that brand out there that people trust. And they're real quick to, you know, do some things they may or may not have thought is the best decision just to hear you out. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree, man. So, um, all right, I wanted to kind of move things along here. Um, I want to talk about content, dude, because I love the stuff that you do. I think it's really creative. Um, talk to me. You know, I would love, here's what I would love, man. I always like to leave something behind for the, for, for the listeners, right? Something that they can take back to the dealership today. And, and implement it if they so choose to. Um, tell me about your strategy. Like, how does your mind work, right? Because a lot of the stuff that, that I see that you put out there is it's creative, it's funny, it's attention grabbing. Um, you know, it's 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 one of those things that, like you said earlier, like you have kind of three different paths on social media. You could post it for free, you could boost it, you could create an ad, right? The stuff that I see from you is stuff that I envision you can put on your website as a post, which I'm not the biggest fan of, but it would still get a lot of engagement just because it's attention grabbing. You know, it's stuff that I, I would envision people sharing with their friends like, oh, dude, look at this. It's this hilarious sort of a deal. Right. Um, when you when you when you put these things together, you know, like where does your mind go, dude? Like like how do you how do you come up with this stuff? <laughs> I was, I've always been a people call me a disruptor. Okay. Well, I've always been a disruptor apparently because when I was in school, my teacher used to always say, Benny, you're being really disruptive. So I guess <laughs> you know, that, that shit means, I don't know, but I, I guess I want to put out there what I've been in marketing for a long time. So I know kind of, you know, what makes people tick to hear somebody's story. And if it's really a compelling story, I want to put that out there because it's going to resonate with an audience. You know, if you put out a great story, I'm probably going to share that because there's somebody that I know that can relate to that, or there's somebody that right. I know that needs to see that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. There's also, also the educational aspect of it. People like to be educated. Uh, did you know these different types of things? So think about a way where you can educate somebody where, you know, they're like, wow, that's a thought provoking topic you know that we're looking at right now and what we're doing right now and all these things and the other thing that i do is i just try to have everybody be themselves embrace who you are focus on your strengths you know your your weaknesses will go away if you have a funny guy at the store that's always funny do a little funny video about him it's, it's not about selling the car if you have somebody that's an amazing just a super whiz a tech you know that's in the back of the service department Put the camera back there and let him educate people, you know, on different types of things. But ultimately, it's really taking everything that we've ever learned and thought about the car business and adding elements to that. So, you know, what is it that separates you? How are you different? I guarantee you, if you walk into the back of your dealership right now and you say, hey, this is our service manager, John. John, tell the audience three things they may not know about you. And he's like, well, I'm a huge fan of pudding pops. I like gangster rap music. And, you know, I drive a Ford and I'll never drive a Chevy, but I work at a Chevy store. And you cut it off. <laughs> All the time people are like, what? What do you say? So it's not that you have to, you know, push the boundaries too much, but be yourself and let people in a little bit. You know, let them know what it is that you do and let them know why they should watch another video without telling them. That's like the big key with everything that I do. People say, Benny, how do you do this? How do you develop a strategy? How do you do that? How do you do this? If you follow me on social media, you literally will learn every single thing and exactly how I do it. I tell you, I just don't tell you if that makes sense.
Yeah, no, I so, can I get that. I get yeah, that. The same way across the board. I'm very interested in a whole lot of things, you know, that that other people might not be interested in. But then again, I'm not so much interested in things that other people would be. And here's an example of that. You know, the the new Silverado 2500 HD came out, and this year, you know, they they adjusted the mirrors on the side because it was, you know, causing disruption in your visibility when you're towing a trailer. That didn't intrigue me at all, did nothing for me. But there's a huge audience out there of people that are like, damn, that's super cool. Cause I got that same exact truck right now. And I hate that whenever my blind spots, you know, get affected or, you know, I can't see my trailer from behind or man on the new Fords right here, the new Chevys, these backup cameras that can see behind the trailer while I'm driving. Some people that don't even tow a trailer, that camera comes on and you can literally see the person behind you while you're driving down the road. Not the most safe, thing I've ever seen, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> it's compelling. It's just putting things out there that you might not have known before that have nothing to do with your product or your service. Yeah. So um, do you think that we're afraid in the, in, in the automotive? Well, I know we're afraid to, you know, hit the, the record button on our, on our mobile devices and create content. I know that much. Um, I think it's getting better. I think, I think a lot of us have, uh, have uh, kind of uh, opened ourselves up to that and 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 i love seeing that in our industry because i i, I it's just why would you not build a brand for yourself in, in right. this business i mean it just it just it makes sense right but do you think that that we're afraid still to take that even a step further and create content that's genuine to us as an individual and maybe a lot of us are just portraying something because because it's, oh, it's on video, so I have to maybe, um, you know, be formal or I have to be a certain way um, and I'm not really showing, I'm actually doing a disservice to myself because I'm not sure, I'm, my, uh, my genuine self isn't coming through in my messaging. I mean, do you think that there's some of that going on? Yes, I, I totally do. And I'm just gonna say this, I don't care. I went to the St. Louis Auto Association's holiday party the other night, okay? And in St. Louis, there's really like the five families when it comes to franchise dealerships and who dominates the market. There's really only five people. Well, all five of these guys were standing in a line talking to each other. They will eat their kids for breakfast when it comes down <laughs> to selling cars and being competitive. But they were literally standing there all together. And I felt like a little kid. I was starstruck. I was like, is that, is that Kenny Rogers? You know, like, oh my God, like, it's amazing. I grew up hearing all of the TV ads, the radio ads, all of this my whole life. And now to be able to be in the same room with not just one, but all five of these individuals that represent the five families, that was huge for me. But at the same time, I'm looking at the biggest one and I'm staring at him going, why do you not change your go-to-market strategy, your messaging to resonate with a population that isn't the same people that bought from you in 1973. Yes. And I see it over and over and it hurts my heart because I could just, just give me a chance, buddy, give me a chance. However, his agency and I live in the same neighborhood and I'm just like, well, I don't do that kind of shit. But at the same time, I'm like, damn, we got 37 stores. Like, let's, let's, let's get you to 2019, you know? <laughs> oh, man. Gets, but yeah, I, I see it and I feel it. But the shitty thing is for a lot of guys like me that are, you know, trying to push the envelope, take it to the next level and do all that is if, if you don't know the business, and you don't understand certain things, guys like I just talked about, they haven't seen any decrease in sales. They haven't seen any decrease in retention. They haven't seen any decrease in anything because they're not doing it my way or the new way or anything like that. So you have to respect the people that still use direct mail, the radio, the TV, that don't use social media, that will never ever you know get on their smartphone and make a video or right. you know, make themselves you know, look at all vulnerable, you know? So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things out there that I would love to do, but at the same time, you know, if I go into your store and you're breaking records every month, you're dominating my entire market doing the exact opposite of what I'm doing. I respect you, man. I really yeah. do. I think yeah. you need to come on with it, but I respect yeah. <laughs> That's a great point, man, because um, you know, for all that, that we, you know, that a lot of us are, are talking about, 
you know, doing things differently. There, there are, there are stores out there that are still succeeding with the, with the, with the old uh, um, strategies, if you will. Right. And so it's really hard to, um, it's hard to argue with success. And I don't know who said that, but you know, I mean, it's hard to argue with that. There's a guy in my market right now. It's and I, I'll call him out. It's Dave Sinclair Ford. Okay, the 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 dad, Dave Sinclair. You know, he was around forever. He was a podium guy. Stood behind the podium. You know, he talked like the president. You know, with his hand like this and everything to you. <laughs> his tagline at the end of every commercial was, "If it's not right, I'll make it right." And he stared you straight in the eye on the TV and he said, if it's not right, I'll make it right. And you believe that shit. You believe that shit <laughs> for anything in the world, you believe it. So the other day I happened to talk to somebody and he said, he said, man, you know, he's like, I'm with Dave Sinclair Ford. I said, man, that the original Dave Sinclair, when he said, if it's not right, I'll make it right. I said, man, that convinced me. I said, I would buy every car in the world from him. And he goes, <laughs> They didn't have re review sites back then, Benny. And I was like, oh, why did you tell me that? Because um, in my mind, the guy's the same. But, you know, that's the type of stuff that I look at. And I'm I'm just chomping at the bit. I'm like, I'm going to keep calling you every day. We're going to do a video together. I promise <laughs> you know we're going to do it. <laughs> But that that's intriguing to me. I just I have a lot of passion for the industry. You know, I, I appreciate and respect the guys that have come way before me that, you know, are still in the game or pass the torch to somebody else, you know, typically a son or, you know, a yeah. nephew or uncle or whatever. And it's just it's so much fun, man. Just getting to learn yeah, and share ideas. I, no, I agree. I think that the uh, I think that we have to be a little bit careful. Um on this side of things right and when i say this side on the digital like myself i consider myself more on the digital than the traditional i still believe the traditional has has its place i'm not advocating and i never i don't think i ever will advocate unless the mediums change so drastically but i don't think i ever would advocate to not do traditional i mean i i have tv and radio background so i i i understand those mediums a little bit and i think that they have a place and they have an audience and all these things uh, but I think we have to be a little bit careful when we when we go too far into the digital side of things, you know, um, and we have to be able to um, recognize that we can't just change everything like this overnight because that's dangerous too. We have to kind of find a, a way to do it slow and steady, right? Um, and I was having a conversation on, on the podcast recently, I believe it was with Max Zanin. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the generational changes, right? So the 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 older generation that's about to retire and walk, uh, you know, out into the sunset. Like it's very hard for those people to change because they're, dude, they've been through the internet change, they've been through the digital, and they're like, dude, just no more change. I, I got four more years left. Let's just, let me just finish my career, right? And then you have the people that are coming behind them that want those roles and want to want to take those roles, and they're all about digital, 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 right? Like everything has to be digital, and traditional has to go away. And, and, and if you do that too quick, too fast, you're going to leave a chunk of the, of, the, of the audience that is in between those two mediums and you're gonna, you can lose some business, right? I agree. Um, so, yeah, so you got to be really careful with that and you got to try to find a balance. You got to remember that, you're, that you still have a, a customer set that grew up with TV, that grew up listening to radio and they're still going to buy cars, right? And so we got to make sure that we're capturing those folks as well. So... But you yeah, but, but, good, you know? find your audience and own them. If your audience, yeah. you know, is primarily a direct mail, you know, six o'clock news and AM radio audience, well, you damn sure better put 90% of your money on those platforms because that's where your audience is. Right. You know, so here's a little, little funny thing that, you know, people can take away if they want. If you're a digital guy and you're young or whatever and you're you're coming in strong, you're gonna change the whole world with digital. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna I change the car work. business, man. Right, like woo, -hoo! we gonna change <laughs> and shit. But yeah. I had a dealer give me all of their 1980s 30 second TV spots in digital format. And I put them all on Facebook and Instagram. Oh, that's and awesome. that. You would never believe these young people were like. They didn't even have HD back then. Look at the shoes he's wearing. Oh my God, is that a Cavalier? Is that a Pontiac? 
They don't even make them. Dude, it's amazing. So if you have old school 30 second commercials from the 80s, put that shit on social media yeah. and it will blow up. People love it. That's a great idea, man. I love that. Cool. Dude, dude, this has been so so amazing. I've had a lot of fun doing this this session, dude. I'm gonna put you on the spot. You gotta come back. You gotta do session two. This has been a lot, Absolutely. a lot of fun, man. Um, I want to give you a couple minutes to talk about what you do. To, you know, how how can people get in touch with you? Um, I also want to tell the, the the listeners you gotta check out this dude. Check out his content. It's it's really fresh stuff. It's uh, I love the perspective and you're going to get some ideas. So make sure to follow him on LinkedIn and everywhere else he is. We're going to put all your contact information in the show notes. If you're cool with that. Um, Absolutely. Thank yeah. But let us know, man, how can we get in touch with you? What do you do? How can you, you know, if somebody wants to work with you, like how can they get in touch with you? Man? You can call me 314-879-4049. You can go to my website, marketing solutions, stl.com. You can find me on all of the social channels. You can email me at Benny, B-E-N-N-Y, at MarketingSolutionsSTL.com. We're a full-service digital marketing agency, but we take it a step further in two cases. Number one, we actually give a shit. And <laughs> what I mean by that is... We Dude, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> this is dope. So um, I love it. So is that is that your, is that your tagline? We give a shit. We yeah. give a shit. <laughs> I love that. That's so awesome. <laughs> because truly, like, what I mean by that is if I have one of my dealers call me at 8 o'clock on a Friday night, I'm going to answer that phone. I'm going to stop what I'm doing, and I'm going to make sure that I address their concern. I'm probably not going to run home, you know, from the bar and take care of it right exact that second, but I'm going to make sure that we're efficient, that we understand the goals. We have the transparency, the trust, the relationship, because at the end of the day, I work for you and you work for me. It's a partnership. That's what it is. I feel responsible for you hitting your objectives on a monthly basis. I feel responsible for you hitting all of your goals to align your audience with the products and services that they're most engaged with and to make sure that that audience doesn't forget you. Customer attention is huge. Repeat and referral business is the biggest, in my opinion, because your profit margins are so much higher. I truly believe in the lowest cost per entry. I truly believe in understanding who you are, what you represent, what your competitive edge is, and your differentiators. At the end of the day, you know, we have to look at pump and pump out reports. We have to look at you know, your gross profits. We have to look at market share, not just to your competitors for your brand, but also you know, if you're only selling 15% of the Silverados in your market in your eight to 10 mile radius in your backyard, because you're trying to expand your reach, well, let's slow the, let's slow down a little bit and own our market and our audience. And really having that open communication and doing those types of things, having SLAs and turnaround times that are realistic. I won't let anybody on my entire team not answer an email after 24 hours. You have to answer an email within 24 hours. You have to. That's yeah, what people no, expect. That's the efficiency. Those are the types of things in the service. Also, the creative that we take and that we look at is going to be a lot different. You know, it, it, it used to always be symptom solution call to action. Oh, your car broke down. I got a new one. Call, call now and it's 200 bucks a month. You know, that's the old school approach. I'm not against it. It still works. But let's also take a different go-to-market strategy. Let's expose you as a human, as a brand, as a person, as the, the other things that you might like. You know, there's a video that I typically do is meet the staff. So I'll interview the sales guys. I'll interview the management team, you know, upper management, your service department, parts department, things like that. And I went and I have a client that I do work for on the side. He is a roofing contractor. And he said, you know, my dad saw a video of one of the dealer principals that you did and said, he thinks he might go buy a car from that guy because, man, he had a damn good story. This is a 78-year-old man that refurbishes, like, super-duper old cars from, like, the 1920s and the 1930s that saw a video, and now all of a sudden he's intrigued in purchasing from this individual. So. Yeah. I'm not the type of guy that's going to take your whole brand and flip it upside down, tell you everything that you've ever done in the past is shit. And if you don't do it my way, you're going to die and lose all this money and everything. But at the same time, I really want to focus on your audience, you know, build that brand, 
continue the trust, appreciate and respect the legacy that the brand or the person before you has built for this whole time. But at the end of the day, I got to have you in the black, black. I don't do well when you're in the red and I feel totally <laughs> responsible for your sales. And I guess that's my differentiator. Do I give a shit? Hell yeah, I do. But I am, I feel solely responsible for your successes when it comes to your sales. I deliver the marketing. I deliver the leads. I do what I'm supposed to do. However, I'm sitting at home at 10 o'clock at night, listening to your recorded phone calls to your BDC, looking at the follow-up on the form fills that you had, checking your show rate, checking your closing percentage. How are we doing right now? I truly believe in the relationship and I want to see everybody succeed, man. Right on, dude. I love that, man. That's dope. Um, dude, this has been a lot of fun, man. Part two. Thank you. It's already, it's done deal. We're going to do it. Um, so um, thank you so much, dude. Thanks for coming on. So there's one question I ask everybody that uh, comes on the show. And that question is, where do you see the automotive industry headed in the next five years and why? I see the automotive industry heading into a great direction of success. I'm, I'm not scared of Carvana. I'm really not. Honestly, like I said, any dealer is going to go, you know, deliver a vehicle whenever they want. The convenience, the ease, those types of things, you know, those people are going to have to implement that. You know, the, the consumers are going to demand it. So right. we have to implement it. But at yeah. the end of the day, yeah, there's electric cars, there's Elon Musk, there's Tesla, there's all this shit. You know, in five years, you know what I'm going to do? Probably trade in my Malibu on another Malibu because people drive cars, people live in houses. When I was five years old, I thought everybody was going to be the Jetsons when I was 40. Well, right, yeah, right. Yeah. It changed. So, <laughs> let's be realistic and let's focus on our strength. You know, at the end of the day, it's, it, it's about the consumer. It's about, you know, the trust factor. It's about do both parties feel like they, you know, had a good shake. And mm -hmm. let's continue on with what we've been doing because we haven't done anything as an industry that's that detrimental where people right. are now purchasing horses and golf carts. Yeah. They're, they're not, they're buying cars, they're buying trucks and they're going to continue to do so. So don't believe the hype, believe in yourself, take care of your people. You'll be good, man. There you go. All right, folks, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. If you haven't done so, please, please make sure to share this podcast, share this episode with somebody that can benefit from this information so that they can take it back to the dealership and implement in their day to day. Um, Benny, dude, amazing. Thank you for your time, your insights. We appreciate you, brother. Um, that's all the time we have. And as usual, we'll talk later.